Good day and welcome to today's American Lung Association webcast, Asthma Care Coverage Update for 2023. Before we begin, as a reminder, on the left side of your screen, there are multiple application widgets you can use. All boxes are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. For the best viewing experience, we recommend using a wired internet connection and closing any programs or browser sessions running in the background that could cause issues. If you have any technical difficulties during the webcast, please let us know via the Q&A box. If you have any questions for the presenters during the webcast, you can also submit those within the Q&A box. Now I will turn the presentation over to Hannah Green, National Senior Director of Health Policy for the American Lung Association. Thank you so, so much and uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are, um, and happy World Asthma Day. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, really excited to, to be here um, with you all today to talk about um, some of the progress that we have made in improving access to guidelines-based care for patients with asthma and a lot of work that we still need to do. Next slide, please. So here's our agenda for our webcast today. Um, we're gonna start with a little bit of background about the American Lung Association's Asthma Guidelines-Based Care Coverage Project um, and share our latest information on coverage of asthma care in state Medicaid programs for 2023. From there, we're gonna um, transition to talking a little bit about SMART, single um, uh, maintenance and relief therapy, uh, which is a newer treatment option for patients with asthma. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about what it is, what are some of the barriers to patients using it and share some new data we have from our um, coverage assessment this year, looking at how state Medicaid programs are covering SMART. And uh, we'll wrap up with some um, other updates about Asthma Awareness Month um, and a few other um, campaigns at the American Lung Association and uh, have plenty of time at Q for Q&A at the end. So please continue to um, chat in your questions as we go. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Jacqueline Link, who is the National Specialist for Health Policy with the American Lung Association. Great, thank you, Hannah. Um, like she said, I'm the National Specialist for Health Policy at the Lung Association, and I'm gonna be taking us through our project and our findings from this year. So a quick overview of our asthma guidelines-based care coverage project. It was launched in 2015 with funding from CDC, and this project is designed to track asthma coverage in Medicaid in all 50 states and DC and Puerto Rico. And we use the NAEPP guidelines or the National Asthma Education and Prevention Programs updated 2022 guidelines. Um, and we go through and we identify gaps between what is known to be best practice in improving asthma outcomes and what is actually covered by all of these state Medicaid programs. And we also do this to promote collaboration between diverse stakeholder groups to increase access to guidelines-based asthma care. And we focus on the Medicaid program, which um, covers one in four Americans and 43% of the Medicaid population are children. Asthma rates are also consistently higher among the Medicaid population, so it's important for patient health and equitable access to care that states cover the full asthma guidelines with their Medicaid programs. So here's a quick rundown of what we track, but we're going to go into more detail in a couple slides. But we cover eight components of coverage. Um, these are quick relief medications, controller medications, medical devices, allergy testing, allergen immunotherapy, lung function testing, home visits, and self-management education. And then we also go through seven barriers to care um, that can appear in all of these components of coverage. These include age limits, um, any age limit that is outside of FDA's recommended age limit for medications, co-payments, durable medical equipment, which is when a patient has to pay out of pocket for equipment and then be reimbursed, eligibility criteria, prior authorization, quantity limits, and stepped therapy, which is when a patient may have to try a different medication before they can get the medication that their provider has prescribed for them. Some of these categories were added more recently. Um, lung function testing was added in 2021. Um, we've been consistently following NAEPP's guidelines um, and updates as we go along. 
So we can find all of our state data at lung.org. This is just a snapshot of some of the raw data that you can find on our website. Um, this, for example, is Vermont's coverage. Um, and you can see that this is the breakdown of the four different quick relief medications that we track. And you can see yes or no for if it's covered, yes or no for if there's an age limit, a copay, and so on. Um, and we use this to show you the exact breakdown of everything that is covered and isn't covered. Um, many states also have multiple plans, multiple managed care organizations, and if that's the case, you may see a star, which means that the coverage varied by um, plan, um, because we do look at every plan that is in each state's Medicaid program. We also have state PDFs available online as well. Um, And you can see these as well. These are um, a more straightforward, easy way to um, read. I'm sorry, I don't know if the if my slides are following. Okay, sorry. There we go. Um, we also have state PDFs on available online as well. These are a more easy way to see what's covered and what's not covered in your state's Medicaid program. And um, it's a very straightforward way to identify gaps in your state's program. Um, those are also on lung.org. So um, let's get into this year's findings and this year's coverage data. Um, starting with quick relief medications, um, these are albuterol and levalbuterol, both in the nebulized form and in the inhaler form. These are our fast acting medications for immediate relief of asthma symptoms. Um, and this year we found that 43 states covered all quick relief medications, um, but only one, which was California, covered them all without any barriers. So no copays, no prior authorizations, none of that for patients to access those medications. Um, we also found that the remaining nine states had varying coverage or some coverage, meaning that at least one of their plans could not be confirmed um, as covering that medication. Moving on to controller medications, um, this is a pretty broad um, component of care. This is 21 different medications and they can be used or taken daily um, on a long-term basis to control asthma. Uh, these can include beta antagonists, inhaled and systemic corticosteroids, and combined medications. Um, this pretty much includes most medications that you can think of for asthma um, besides the quick relief meds that we already talked about. Um, and coverage of controller medications was pretty similar to quick relief medications with slightly more states varying um, coverage. We found that 34 states covered it with barriers and 18 states had varying coverage of controller meds. Moving on to our medical devices, we also track coverage of three different types of medical devices. These are nebulizers, peak flow meters, and valved holding chambers. And similar to the medications, if a state didn't cover even one of those three, it would have been marked as having some coverage instead of having full coverage of those. Here we found that 32 states covered all three devices with some barriers and 19 states had some coverage of those three devices. We also had one state, which was Puerto Rico, that could not confirm coverage of medical devices, which is why it is white on our map. For allergy testing, um, this is a test for identifying asthma triggers, which is also part of our benchmark. We see some pretty good coverage of this one, um, and we have about 40 states that provide full coverage of this, including eight states that have no barriers at all for this service. Um, and then we have 12 states that had um, some coverage of asthma of allergy testing. And allergy immunotherapy, which goes hand in hand with the allergy testing, has pretty similar coverage. Um, we found that 38 states covered this fully with eight states that had no barriers again for this um, service. And then there were about 14 states that had some coverage of this service. Um, and we found that these were the most widely covered asthma services of our benchmark components. 
Lung function testing is the newest addition to asthma guidelines-based care. Um, this category was only added in 2020, so we don't have as much data going back for coverage of this, but we did collect it this year and last year. Um, lung function testing includes spirometry, which measures lung capacity, and it includes pheno testing, which stands for fractured exhaled nitrous oxide testing, which measures airway inflammation. So once again, states had to cover both of those two things to be considered as having full coverage or to be pink on our map. Um, pheno testing is a little bit newer. So many states would cover, um, we would find that a lot of states covered spirometry, but not pheno testing. Um, but we do have 25 states that fully covered lung function testing, including seven without barriers, and 27 states had um, some coverage or varying coverage of testing. Moving on to home visits, this is clearly where we see the largest room for improvement of guidelines-based asthma care. Um, we have 12 states with partial coverage, which means that at least one plan or one managed care organization in that state had um, you know, covered or offered home visits for patients, but this was not necessarily an option for all Medicaid patients in their state. Um, only Missouri, Rhode Island, and Connecticut offered this for all of their Medicaid um, patients. Um, so, and the rest of the states have no coverage or no information available. Um, an asthma home visit is a very specific type of visit. We're looking for a minor intensity intervention home visit in which the provider is assessing the patient's home for asthma triggers like pests or dust, and where the provider comes for at least two separate visits. Um, we see a lot of plans that say that they offer case management for patients with asthma or home respiratory therapy, and those are not the same as a home visit. That's not quite what we're looking for here when we are doing our data collection. Finally, our last category of coverage that we were looking at was asthma self-management education. And this is um, any form of education provided directly to patients on how to monitor and manage their asthma. It could be something as simple as showing the patient how to use their nebulizer or their inhaler. Um, however, this does not include case management or disease management programs that some states may offer for patients with asthma. We found that 20 states had varying or some coverage of self-management education, and 31 states had full coverage of self-management education, and Kentucky was the only state that could not confirm that they had coverage of this service. We also were collecting data on drug and specialist visit limits. Um, many states may impose prescription drug limits um, on patients at a program-wide level um, in the Medicaid program. And while we were collecting our data, we found that there were seven states that have prescription drug limits um, for all plans, and one state that had um, drug limits that varied by plan, as well as 36 states without prescription drug limits. Um, and these are pretty important in looking at um, access to care because prescription drug limits can impact the coverage of patients. If you are only able to get as many as three prescriptions per month, an asthma patient might need two or three medications just to manage their condition. So if they have any comorbidities or if any viruses or diseases come up, they might be forced to choose between their medications for that month. Um, and while many plans will say, well, we have an appeals process for that, that can also take up um, important time for patients um, who need to get their meds immediately. Um, and it can also drain patients who might not have the resources or health literacy to navigate that type of process. So that can be a bit of a challenge. We also look at states that impose specialist limits. Um, this is similar to prescription drug limits, but it is limiting the number of specialist doctors that a patient can see in a month or in a year. Um, but patients with asthma may have, um, have many doctors and may need to see different specialists like an allergy specialist or a pulmonologist. So limiting the number of specialists that they have can also make it difficult to receive proper asthma care. Um, and we found that eight states impose specialist limits and 36 states have no specialist limits. 
So what does it all mean? Um, so we've been collecting this data for a while. So we put together this chart that can show you each of the types of care that we're looking at and the number of states that provided full, not partial, but full coverage each year since 2019. Um, and you can see that there's a pretty general upwards trend for most of these components of care, um, that they have all started a bit lower but are ending a bit higher, and that's pretty exciting to look at. However, we can see that there's one area, which is home visits, where there has been pretty much no improvement um, in coverage since 2019. Um, another way to look at um, change over time is to compare the improvement by state. Um, so we also put together this uh, GIF, which shows you how many categories of care each state covered in 2017, 2020, and 2023. Um, the darker the color, the more categories or components that that state fully covered. So you can see that the map is you know, getting darker over the years, which definitely shows that there is improvement happening amongst pretty much all of the states as we go. So overall, we've got a couple key conclusions. When we're identifying gaps in coverage, we still see that home visits, um, at least a minor intensity asthma home visit, is the biggest need um, for improvement as we go forward. Um, but every state has at least one area where they can improve, so we encourage you to check out your state's data at lung.org to see um, what could be done in your state. Um, we also know that ensuring full coverage and removing these types of barriers is the best way to increase positive health outcomes for asthma patients. Um, Copays even as small as a dollar to five dollars can deter patients from getting care, so it's really important um, for improving coverage and general health equity that we are um, looking at the best way to cover um, patients' care. And overall, um, there's been some notable improvement in coverage, which is really encouraging, and we look forward to seeing continued improvement in coverage um, as we continue this project. Um, so I will pass it back to Hannah, um, and she can introduce our next guest. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, this is a really great overview of some of our findings from this year, um, and, and great to see some of the progress that has been made. Um, so we're going to switch gears now and, and do a deeper dive on SMART, which, as I said below, single maintenance and or earlier, excuse me, single maintenance and reliever therapy. Um, really excited to have Dr. James Krings here with us today, who's the assistant professor of medicine in the Department of Pulmonary and Critical Care at Washington University in St. Louis School of Medicine. Um, Dr. Krings is also an early career investigator uh, uh, with the American Lung Association's Airways Clinical Research Network, ACRC. Um, and this is uh, the nation's largest non-for-profit network of clinical research centers de de dedicated to asthma and COPD. So excited to hear about uh, Dr. Kring's work on, on implementation of smart therapy and some of the barriers we're seeing there. So I will turn it over to him. I just want to say thank you to everybody else for um, talking about the uh, talking about access and giving me an opportunity to talk about smart therapy um, and happy World Asthma Day uh, to everybody. Um, uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So, um, as was said, I, um, I do have funding from the ALA as well as the NIH, and I. Um, also, am involved in some industry-funded uh, studies, uh, both from Sanofi as well as um, AstraZeneca, and have served on advisory boards um, for Sanofi as well as uh, Genentech. So I want to start with what um, I think the state of the asthma union is. Where, where are we at right now in asthma? And I think my arguments to people would be, one, asthma is uh, very common. And despite the fact that we have new and often very expensive medicines uh, for asthma, the outcomes for uh, most people are not improving over time. The other uh, point I would make to people is that asthma is marked by uh, humongous inequities, and there may be a simpler way to do things. Um, and I, I think that uh, we'll speak a little bit to what smart therapy is here in a minute. 
So my, my first argument that asthma is common and that isn't improving, I, I think um, that's backed up by um, figures like this. So asthma affects 25 million people in the United States and more than 300 million people in the world. On the right is a, a, um, a graph from the CDC that looks at the prevalence of asthma by year. I think most people would agree that that, that graph is pretty flat. Uh, certainly the prevalence of asthma uh, is not going down. And if we look back 20 years prior to that, the prevalence of asthma has increased some. And there's um, some experts that think that the prevalence of asthma is only going to increase more uh, down the road. The, ne the next point I would make to people is that the mortality from asthma is not declining. And that's in the context of us having um, uh, new biologic medicines for asthma um, that are fantastic for some people, but still our mortality from asthma is not declining. So on the left is a, a graph um, that looks at the mortality from cancer. The, the, the purple line at the bottom is the, the cancer moonshot goal um, uh, for the, the mortality from cancer. And then it's they separated the yellow line is uh, the mortality for females from cancer, the, the green line is uh, for males, and then the blue line is overall. If you look for over the last 20 years, the mortality from uh, cancer has decreased um, over time, and hopefully it'll continue to decrease. If we compare that to the graph on the right, the graph on the right is the uh, mortality from asthma, and it's basically over the exact same timeline of the last 20 years. And you can see that despite us having new medicines, mortality from asthma uh, has not improved. The, the next thing I would uh, point out to people is that many people um, that are having mortality from asthma are, are using uh, short-acting beta agonists or SABA monotherapy alone, meaning that they are um, only using uh, a an albuterol or levalbuterol inhaler. Um, I take care of people in the intensive care unit clinically, and I'll often have a resident uh, point out to me um, when we're seeing somebody in the intensive care unit that's very sick uh, with asthma, wow, that, that person was only prescribed albuterol. Can you believe that? Their, their asthma is so severe that they're in the intensive care unit and they were only prescribed albuterol. And my response to them is normally the same. Well, I, I can believe that. That's not uncommon. Nearly half of people that are dying from asthma uh, never used anything besides albuterol uh, in the last year. We know um, that for every canister of albuterol that somebody uh, gets filled in a prior year, the risk of mortality goes up. Uh, however, if uh, people are filling an ICS or an inhaled corticosteroid inhaler, um, their risk of death from asthma goes down. And that, this is these are findings that have been well known for 20 to 30 years. This is a graph on the right from the New England Journal of Medicine in the year 2000 that look at as people are prescribed more inhaled corticosteroids, their, their risk of death goes down. The, the next point I would make to people is that um, asthma is marked by uh, inequities. So this is a graph from the CDC that looks at the asthma mortality rate per million by race and ethnicity. And I, I highlighted the top two. Um, the uh, black non-Hispanics non um, have a nearly three times higher mortality than their white non-Hispanic counterparts. We uh, created um, some graphs and maps um, in our local community. I'm based at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. And so we, uh, we created some graphs looking at the uh, mortality broken down by race and ethnicity in our local community. And I think that the top graph is pretty striking. The, the red bars uh, represent uh, black or African Americans. And, um, and then the other um, bars represent uh, people that identify with a different race or ethnicity. And you can see over time that um, people that identify as black or African American have a marked uh, higher hospitalization rate um, as compared to their other counterparts. The bottom, we created three different maps. Um, oh, excuse me. At the bottom, we created three different maps. Um, on the bottom left is looking um, at the asthma hospitalization rate. The middle one is looking at um, the uh, 
percent of the population that identifies as uh, black or African American, and on the bottom right is the uh, percent of families that are living below the poverty line. And we can see that in St. Louis, uh, the the asthma is really uh, clustered in North St. Louis, um, that is um, marked by more poverty, and uh, more more black or African Americans live. And I would I would ask people, you know, what would these maps look like in your local community? We did this for St. Louis. Um, similar work's been done in uh, Pittsburgh, Oakland, um, uh, uh, San Francisco, and these maps look very uh, very similar. So I think we know we need to do better. Um, the next thing to ask is what can we do better on in asthma? And obviously this is a complicated thing. This is not unique to asthma. These, these, um, there are inequities in uh, many different diseases, but these are just some of my thoughts. One, um, inhalers are confusing and they're still too expensive. Most encounters uh, for asthma don't result in providers using evidence-based asthma care. I think we need to remember that most asthma encounters um, occur in primary care settings or the ER. Most people are not getting prescribed their inhalers uh, from a pulmonologist. And the next thing I would ask is, have we made things too complex? Um, and can we simplify inhaler paradigms? So this is a, um, a, uh, a chart that we have in our clinics here that um, look at all the different respiratory inhalers that are currently available. Um, Everyone has multiple different doses. They have um, a different technique for how uh, people are supposed to use them. Um, some call for people to use a spacer device, some don't. Um, and I will say as a provider, sometimes it can be frustrating because you think uh, one uh, type of inhaler will be covered and you spend time instructing people on how to use it only to find out that it's not covered. Um, and when I ask my pulmonary fellows um, uh, different things about different inhalers, I find even many of them don't know exactly what every inhaler is. The next thing I'd point out is that uh, in the United States, we have an over-the-counter uh, asthma medicine that maybe we don't talk a lot about, but there's um, inhaled epinephrine or brand name Primatine Mist um, that is available over-the-counter, and that provides just inhaled epinephrine. It doesn't uh, provide any inhaled corticosteroid. So is this all becoming un unnecessary? Um, can we simplify things and can people be prescribed and trained on one inhaler? And my argument over the next few slides is going to be probably yes, or at least that's the way things are moving. Uh, Budesonide for Motorol as needed or smart therapy allows us to really prescribe one inhaler um, and it, it, it offers a lot more simplicity for people rather than uh, all these different inhalers. So this is the latest guidelines um, for, I'm going to start with people with mild asthma and then I'll move on to moderate to severe asthma. So mild asthma, uh, this, uh, this is people that have, uh, are prescribed step one or step two therapy. The top is looking at the uh, GINA recommendations um, uh, and the bottom is looking at the NAEPP recommendations. And I, in the time that we have, I don't want to get into the nuanced difference between these. But as you can tell at the top, uh, Gina uh, is now recommending that people with mild asthma be prescribed a low-dose uh, inhaled corticosteroid promoterol combination medicine uh, as, a, as a reliever device as the preferred therapy. Um, and this is a this is a completely different paradigm. Uh, classically, for example, people in step two would be prescribed a maintenance inhaler, like a, a maintenance inhaled corticosteroid, and then asked to take a short-acting beta agonist like a albuterol on an as-needed basis. Now, what's being recommended is let's simplify things and just tell people to use a low-dose inhaled corticosteroid uh, with formoterol. Uh, on an on an as needed basis, and I'll, I'll give you some data on on um, on comparing uh, these different treatments. So, what is the rationale for these new guidelines? Well, when people take a short acting beta agonist like albuterol alone, that does nothing to uh, get rid of their airway inflammation, and in fact, in some studies um, dating back uh, twenty to thirty years. Even short-term use of a uh, short-acting beta agonist like albuterol, while not using an inhaled corticosteroid, 
can increase people's airway inflammation and in fact make their airways more responsive. The graphs on the right um, uh, speak to this. So they had people um, frequently take a, uh, a short-acting beta agonist and they did something called a methicoline test. And that was looking at how responsive, how hyper-responsive their airways were. Here, uh, a lower value means that your airways are even more hyper-responsive. So people that are repeatedly taking short-acting beta agonists, um, in fact, had similar uh, to more responsive, hyper-responsive airways, whereas people that were taking inhaled corticosteroids had less hyper-responsive airways. The bottom is looking at sputum eosinophilia. That's a, a marker of airway inflammation. Um, and we can see that people that are uh, were frequently taking short-acting beta agonists had a higher sputum eosinophil count. In fact, their airways were getting more uh, inflamed, whereas people that are taking uh, inhaled corticosteroids have less inflamed airways. So this is a hypothetical example that I try to walk uh, people through. So the, the, the top one is somebody that has mild asthma, and they're prescribed a maintenance inhaled corticosteroid and a short-acting beta agonist like albuterol. However, this is a person that just maybe because of cost or maybe because they simply forget, um, they um, are not taking their maintenance inhaled corticosteroid uh, on a regular basis. So as we go through, the black line represents their asthma symptoms. The yellow line represents their airway inflammation. Perhaps they are um, around a trigger for them. Perhaps they got a, a respiratory virus. Their asthma symptoms represented by the black line are going up. Their airway inflammation at the exact same time is going up. And because they're more symptomatic, they're using their uh, reliever uh, albuterol more and more often. And I, I just demonstrated to you on the last slide that does not make their uh, airways less hyper-responsive, nor does it improve their airway inflammation. So that is cascading out of control. And at some point, they lose uh, complete control of their asthma, and they um, have to go to into the um, ER, and they get a, a course of oral corticosteroids. If we compare that to the bottom, the bottom person is prescribed an inhaled corticosteroid for Motorol as their rescue therapy. As their asthma is, uh, as their asthma symptoms are going up, and their airway inflammation is going up, they're using. Uh, an inhaled corticosteroid combined with formoterol as their rescue therapy. So the formoterol is the beta agonist that's helping uh, open up their airways. And at the same time, they're taking an inhaled corticosteroid that's dealing with their airway inflammation and they're able to avoid uh, the ER altogether. So this has been studied now in four, uh, four large uh, studies, the Sigma-1, Sigma-2, Practical and Novel START trial. Uh, these have enrolled a total of um, uh, a little over 10,000 people, and the results are striking. So when people are prescribed a rescue inhaled corticosteroid from Motorol combination, their risk of having a severe exacerbation is decreased by approximately two-thirds as compared to people that are prescribed uh, albuterol monotherapy. If we compare people that are prescribed a rescue inhaled corticosteroid from Motorol combination versus uh, the traditional way of being prescribed a maintenance inhaled corticosteroid plus short-acting beta agonists, people's risk of having to go to the hospital or ER for asthma is decreased by one-third. Um, this is also in the context of people that are prescribed this uh, inhaler paradigm being exposed to less inhaled corticosteroids in total. Uh, that is particularly important in pediatrics uh, as compared to people that are prescribed maintenance inhaled corticosteroids uh, plus rescue uh, albuterol. There are some caveats here. This, a, a lot of this data was done outside of the United States and was done with a different um, ICS for Motorol device than what is available in the United States. Um, and these, were, these studies were not done uh, in, in um, uh, patients that were less than 12 years old. Next, talking about uh, SMART therapy. So this is people uh, uh, for people with moderate to severe asthma. And this is looking at step three to five of our guidelines. SMART therapy stands for single maintenance and reliever therapy. And 
it's um, basically saying that you're going to use the uh, same inhaler for both your maintenance and rescue uh, use. So looking at the figure on the right, instead of prescribing somebody two different inhalers, one being a uh, maintenance inhaler that normally contains an inhaled corticosteroid, as well as a separate uh, reliever inhaler like albuterol, you only prescribe them one inhaler. Um, and you tell them to use that exact same inhaler that has an inhaled corticosteroid and a steroid and a base as both their maintenance and their reliever therapy. Smart therapy has been studied in more than 22,000 patients and has demonstrated clear superiority uh, over uh, traditional therapy and is now part of our guidelines. Smart therapy reduces a patient's risk of having an exacerbation by 30 to 40%. Uh, one key thing to remember here is that for Motorol must be the long-acting beta agonist. In the United States, there's two uh, ICS uh, for Motorol inhalers. One is uh, Budesonide for Motorol, our brand name Symbicort. The other one is Mometazone for Motorol, our brand name Dulera. We'll talk a, uh, quickly about the barriers um, uh, to these uh, inhalers as well. So. Um, this is a meta-analysis that was in uh, JAMA that looked at people that had lost control of their asthma, and they compared either stepping up uh, their, um, their inhaled corticosteroid dose or uh, flipping them over to SMART. If you flip somebody over to SMART therapy, you decrease their risk of having an exacerbation uh, in the subsequent year by 32%. So, with funding from the ALA, uh, we did some recent qualitative work uh, where we have been interviewing patients and providers and uh, trying to learn why they are or are not using uh, smart therapy. This is one quote that a primary care provider uh, told us. The biggest benefit of these new inhaler approach is having one inhaler rather than having two different inhalers. I've lost track of how many patients have mistaken their maintenance therapy versus their rescue. And yet we know that smart, um, smart therapy is severely underprescribed. Less than 10% of prescribers are, are using smart therapy. So we're asking ourselves why. This is um, a, um, a, a table that we recently created looking at some of the barriers uh, to smart therapy. And this was uh, recently accepted for uh, publication and we will be uh, presenting this at the American Thoracic Society. A conference uh, later this month. Um, but there are a lot of barriers to smart therapy, which is why work um, that we're doing to look at access in different states to smart therapy is very important. Some of those barriers that people are identifying is um, providers are concerned about whether or not um, uh, an ICS for Motorol inhaler uh, is covered by insurances, whether or not it's on the uh, formulary. There's also some confusion regarding FDA labeling. So the FDA still has ICS for Motorol inhalers uh, as labeled as only uh, for maintenance use, and they haven't uh, labeled that uh, labeled it for reliever use yet. A lot of people told us that they were concerned because it takes time to explain smart therapy in a new inhaler paradigm to people. And people told us that they need more tools uh, to be able to uh, explain smart therapy to people. This is a, uh, a recent publication that we put out um, earlier in 2023 that says that, that we called for the United States um, to accelerate the implementation of smart therapy, uh, recognizing some of the data that I went over uh, with you earlier. We said that we need to develop more tools for clinicians so they can have uh, an easy way to explain smart therapy. We need new asthma action plans. We need to um, press to increase the, uh, the coverage of, of, um, of inhalers that work with smart therapy. We need to recognize that combination inhalers that have Formoterol in them are different than other combination inhalers because the ones that have Formoterol in there are the ones that can be used with smart therapy. And we need to incentivize providers to begin to move to smart therapy. I'll point out one other thing that we are presenting at the American Thoracic Society Conference uh, later this month. We found that for the payer, um, in fact, uh, prescribing somebody an as-needed ICS for Motorol inhaler is less expensive uh, 
um, than, uh, than prescribing some of the maintenance inhaled corticosteroid in short acting beta agonists. So I, um, I live and work in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and so I can speak a little bit to what our local Medicaid, uh, Missouri Health Nut, uh, has been doing with smart therapy. So Missouri Health Nut uh, recognizes that the data for smart therapy and reliever ICS for motor oil therapy is, um, is, is very convincing. And they're, they're willing to cover ICS for motor oil inhalers without prior authorization. They will cover up to two ICS for motor oil inhalers in a single month. Covering two ICS for motor oil inhalers in a single month is very important because you're going to prescribe somebody to use this inhaler as both a maintenance and a reliever device. And this has 120 puffs in it, so people may run out before the end of the month if, if the payer won't uh, cover uh, more than two inhaler or won't cover more than one inhaler in a month. The other thing Missouri Health Nut is doing is they're uh, flagging um, flagging uh, patients that are trying to fill more than three albuterol inhalers in a six month period and recognizing that short acting beta agonist use is associated with mortality and maybe these are the people that need to go back and see their provider and be considered uh, for smart therapy. So I'll conclude now, uh, asthma inhaler therapy has undergone a recent paradigm shift that uh, is improving outcomes there are a lot of barriers uh, to this, including people need to learn about it. It takes time to explain, uh, as well as variable uh, coverage uh, from the payers. Um, we need to be covering ICS for motorol inhalers. It has to have the motorol in there, and we need to consider covering more than one ICS for motorol inhaler uh, in a month. And there are examples of uh, states doing this already, uh, like Missouri that I just talked about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Krings. Um, it was a great presentation. Uh, just as a reminder, if you have any questions, um, you can pop those into the, the Q&A box and we will um, jump over to those um, for Dr. Krings and the rest of our speakers in just a moment. Um, but we did look at um, some of the, the coverage barriers in Medicaid to smart therapy, um, uh, which uh, we're gonna have Rebecca Alegria, our National Coordinator for Health Policy at the Lung Association, jump into right now. Thank you, Hannah. Um, yes, so we, part of our controller medications that we tracked are ac actually the SMART options, Simbicord and Dulera, or um, as we have it here, the generic name, Betacidine and Fermoterol, and Mimethistone and Fermoterol. Um, so we found that 51 states cover both of these medications with six plans varying, um, six states varying by plan, so that means that um, at least one of the plans for the state did not cover um, these medications. We also found that 35 um, states had some type of copay uh, barrier, 20 states um, had a prior authorization barrier for butacidine and for, mo for motorol, um, while 16 had um, a prior authorization barrier for mimethasone and for motorol. Um, we also found 18 states had step therapy barriers uh, for budesidine and for motorol, while 12 had it for mimethasone. Um, and we found that two states had age limit barriers for um, budesidine, while six had it for mimethasone. Um, and then finally, we found 32 states had quality limits uh, for budesidine and for motorol, while 37 had it for mimethasone and for motorol. And just to um, state that we did list states as having a barrier if it appeared in any of the Medicaid plan, whether that was fee-for-service or managed care, uh, for our purposes, it was listed as um, having a barrier. So next slide, please. And this year, we went a little bit more in debt with the quality limits. Uh, for each of these medications, we found that 12 states had a one inhaler per month quality limit uh, for butazidine and for motorol, while 13 had it for mimethasone and for motorol. Um, two states had a two inhaler per month for both of these medications, while only one had a three or more inhaler per month quality limit. We also found that um, 19 states had quality limits that vary per plan for butacidine and for motorol, 
um, and then 19 for mimethasone and for motorol. Um, no quality limits was found on 11 of the states um, for butyrosidine and for motorol, while um, 15 states were found to have no quality limits. And then additionally, we also found that there were six states um, with data not available that we could not include. Um, and we will also be including a issue brief that we did on smart therapy in our follow-up email that will include all of this information as well. And next slide. Now Thanks, I will hand it back to Jacqueline. All right. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, before we uh, jump into Q&A, um, I'm just going to um, turn it over to my colleague, Barbara Kaplan, um, uh, to talk a, a little bit about um, our other activities for Asthma Awareness Month. And then she'll turn it over to, to Jacqueline again to um, talk a little bit about another Medicaid um, uh, update that we're, we're working on as well. Thanks. Hi, everyone, and happy Asthma Awareness Month. Uh, we recognize that everyone can play a part in improving asthma and asthma care um, on World Asthma Day and during Asthma Awareness Month. So we invite you to uh, learn more about asthma by visiting lung.org slash asthma-awareness. Um, you can take our free online class, Asthma Basics. Um, also from that page, uh, earlier uh, this year, we, we recorded a webinar on trends in asthma care where we talk about new treatment options, such as what was covered today um, on smart therapy, um, monoclonal antibodies or biologics. Also, we cover videos on how to use asthma medicines, um, as well as an interactive tool to help you talk with your doctor about asthma. We also have opportunities um, for you to, to join us um, in advocating for criti critical policies that will improve air quality for people with asthma, like setting stronger air pollution standards. Um, and we also invite you to support asthma research by donating to the American Lung Association at lung.org slash donate. Um, um, the other thing that you will find tomorrow, we actually have a web webcast for patients and caregivers. Um, so we hope that you're able to join us or share this with um, your uh, network of folks um, to hear our expert speaker to talk about the caregiver's role in helping to manage a loved one's asthma. So thank you. And I'll talk, turn this over to Jacqueline. Thanks, Barbara. Um, and for our last bit of updates, um, we have a quick update on what's going on in the Medicaid sphere. Um, as uh, COVID-19 has come to an end, the end of the continuous coverage requirements are also approaching. Congress passed protections in 2020 that prevented Medicaid from disenrolling beneficiaries during the COVID-19 pandemic. However, those protections ended this year on April 1st. So all of those states are now in the process of reconfirming or renewing beneficiaries coverage. Um, so pretty much everyone enrolled in Medicaid will go through a renewal process over the next 14 months. Um, and because of this, we are estimating that about 18 million people are going to lose Medicaid coverage as a result of this process. Um, and a large chunk of those we're expecting to lose coverage, not because of changed eligibility, but because of bureaucratic red tape, missing your notifications, failing to complete paperwork and things like that. Um, and we're also expecting um, a good amount of the people who are moved off of Medicaid coverage because of eligibility to then become um, eligible for Affordable Care Act coverage. Um, so there will be a, a large influx of people moving towards that coverage that will be needing assistance and more information about um, their new uh, coverage. Um, so for more information about that, you can go to medicaid.gov slash renewals, and you can actually find your state specific plan about um, their unwinding process. Um, and you can also check out our information on lung.org slash healthcare. Um, and we encourage our stakeholders to be aware of these changes and just make sure that their patient population is also aware of what's going on in the Medicaid world. Um, and with that, we will move to questions.
Yeah, we have a couple um, popping up. Um, the first one is on smart therapy. So what sort of age limits were placed for smart therapy coverage? And was this limited only um, to cover those 12 years or older? So I can start with that one. Um, we count age limits in all of the medications we track um, through the asthma guidelines-based care coverage project. Um, if they are more restrictive than whatever the FDA approved age uh, range is for that medication. So if, if there's an age limit uh, listed, um, it means that it somehow is more restrictive. So if a medication is approved for patients, you know, six and up, maybe it's only the pro plan is only covering it for ages 12 and up, something like that. Um, and they really do, um, you know, differ plan by plan. We have another question, um, maybe this one, Dr. Krinks, you can answer it. How, it. how can we address the barriers that providers and patients are facing in accessing smart therapy? Well, I think this is probably step one. I think that step one is identifying what they are, um, naming them and recognizing that it's important. Um, I think um, coming out with new guidelines, coming out with scientific evidence is only step one. The, the, the follow-up steps are um, how do we make it easier um, for providers to prescribe it? Um, I think they're, you know, uh, increasing coverage of smart therapy, uh, updating asthma plans, um, making it, um, still not, many providers don't know about smart therapy. So going out and helping uh, providers learn about what smart therapy is, how do you prescribe it? What's the evidence behind it? I, I think all of those steps are um, are, are necessary and things that we need to be focusing on now. Yeah, and following up with that, um, we have another question. This is the first time I am learning about smart therapy. Why are more healthcare providers not prescribing smart therapy? And albuterol is a leading asthma medication. Um, mm -hmm. And then this person is also glad that they signed up for this webinar. But um, just to once again, why are prescribers not um, not why why are healthcare providers not prescribing smart therapy? I I, I can take that one. Um, so it's, some of this isn't unique to smart therapy. When 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 new medicines come out, when new guidelines come out, um, it it often takes time for there to be update. People are, are used to prescribing things a certain way and albuterol has been around for a lot of years. So people are, I think, are used to using that as a reliever therapy and and, um, and providers are used to prescribing it as people's reliever therapy. Um, I think that, so that's one aspect of it. The, the second aspect is um, the FDA still hasn't um, labeled uh, ICS for motorol therapy uh, as a reliever therapy. So there, there, that is another um, uh, possible barrier. The, the next one I would point out is um, cost. Uh, depending on uh, who somebody is covered by, um, albuterol may be uh, less uh, costly uh, for them. Um, so they may decide that they want to get their albuterol uh, filled. Um, and some of it is time too. When you're seeing somebody in a busy primary care setting and you're dealing with multiple comorbidities, you, it takes the time to go through what smart therapy is with somebody, uh, update somebody's asthma plan, and, and help them uh, help them learn about it. With all of that being said, I yeah, think yeah, we important. also have another more of a comment, um, but. No, go ahead and sorry. <laughs> no, I was going to say, with that being said, I, it's also very important. I mean, the, the, the data is there that it improves asthma outcomes. So though we're talking about all the barriers, this is still a very important area. Yeah. All right, we have another um, more of a comment, but I think Hannah, um, 
this this one you can answer for medical device coverage um, would it be it would be helpful to know how many devices are covered within 12 month period um, working with pediatric populations i find that families can get one for home but can't get covered to have an additional device at school or after care program or if they do have coverage there are significant efforts required on families or pcps to get approval yeah, I think that's a, a great point and something that we hear a lot. Um, so if you look at the data for your state and some of the that like barriers table that Jacqueline walked through um, at the beginning of our, our webcast, um, you can see um, in your state for each of the three devices, um, if there are prior authorizations uh, limits on coverage, um, as well as if there are any quantity limits. So that's the first place I would go to sort of see like, you know, are there limits on how many devices can be covered in a 12 month period? Um, I think the point that you're making here is really um, most pertinent when it comes to valve holding chambers, because obviously that's something that a lot of patients want to be able to carry, you know, with them with their inhaler, so they're using that properly and, you know, might want to have one at school and at home, you know, depending on how they're, um, you know, to make sure they're not forgetting one in one place. Um, and so we do actually, our kind of standard of care um, in our project for valve holding chambers is that at least two per year are covered. And so you can see if a state is meeting that goal by if there's a little plus sign next to um, valve holding chambers um, on, the, on their page for the state. Um, and that's all sort of outlined on our website exactly, you know, what all those symbols mean and whatnot. But um, that's another good place to, to look. Um, and certainly if you, any of you have questions about, you know, medical device coverage or anything else um, in your state specifically um, that you're not able to figure out on our website, you can always email asthmacare at lung.org and we're happy to, to help uh, walk you through those. Yeah, we have another question that I think um, all of you could answer. What improvements in asthma coverage over the past year or years are you most glad or excited to see? Um, well, I'll start with one that I was excited to see this year, which is that, um, you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, a number of states had temporary policies in place to, um, uh, you know, pause things like copays or prior authorizations or things like that um, to, uh, you know, just ease things during the pandemic. Um, and we have seen some states like during the pandemic take steps to make some of those policies permanent. So as an example, a number of states have stopped charging copays um, in their Medicaid programs over the past couple of years. And, you know, as I think Jacqueline mentioned earlier, we know that, you know, for the Medicaid population in particular, you know, copays as low as, you know, one or five dollars a month can be a real barrier to care. Um, so the fact that some of uh, states have, you know, a couple of states have taken action on those, I think, is, um, you know, a great, a great step. I, I can answer one. I, it's hard for me to say anything other than smart therapy. I think the fact that smart therapy is uh, being increasingly recognized as uh, important by states is 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 uplifting. I, I do. I, I am somewhat nervous about all of the people that are going to be coming or did just uh, come off of Medicaid on April first and how that's going to develop. Um, well, we are just um, have two minutes left. Um, so I know there are a number of questions that we didn't get to um, today. As always, you can, as I said, email us at asthmacare.lung.org and we're happy to, um, to follow up if there were um, things that we didn't get to. Um, before we wrap up, I just want to um, thank our speakers for their time today. I think it's been a really interesting conversation. Um, and I also want to ask all of our attendees, um, a little webcast survey is going to pop up um, at the end of this uh, um, discussion and would really appreciate you sharing your feedback on um, today's webcast and, you know, other ways that we can help you um, work on asthma guidelines-based care moving forward. So with that, uh, we will wrap up and I will say uh, happy World Asthma Day and look forward to um, talking with you all about this topic more uh, in the future. Thanks. <laughs>